Here's a real softball question. What's the optimal rate of tax on capital income? <laughs> <laughs> Closer to the tax rate on other income than to zero. Um, would be, uh, would be, would be my uh, answer to that. A fair amount of capital income reflects rents of one kind or another. Capital income is substantially held by those at uh, the high end. There's a fair amount of what's really capital income in the form of unrealized capital gains that uh, never uh, gets taxed. So I think the right aggregate capital income tax rate is closer to the, what would go with a comprehensive income tax uh, than it is to the alternative idea that capital income taxation is just a way of taxing future consumption, and therefore you should tax future consumption and present consumption at the same rate, and the tax rate should be zero. If we think about the 1980s, there are a lot of models from that time, some coming from your research, where you have an infinite horizon model with a zero tax rate on capital income, at some point enough capital accumulates so that even wages are higher, and there's a kind of steady state long run argument that still the number should be zero. What has changed that makes those models less applicable? Is it that we think the elasticity is different, or is it it's some other variable? What's, what's changed in our knowledge or your understanding? At the technical level, there's been some mathematical work showing that some of the results that you're referring to from the 1980s yes. were just mathematically wrong. That's one part. I think the second and more consequential part is that the premise of those models was essentially that the supply of capital was infinitely elastic. And so you would, whatever the tax rate, you would drive capital to the point where the after-tax rate of return was some fixed number. And that just now looks like a very poor description of reality. We've seen real interest rates fluctuate substantially. And we just don't see that when real interest rates are higher, savings is lots higher. And when real interest rates are lower, savings is lots lower in the way that many people, including me in the early 1980s, uh, would have expected. And so in the absence of uh, that kind of evidence, I think the argument is uh, very much attenuated. What if someone said, well, for the special 20-year period, we lived through Bernanke's East Asian savings class, so there was always enough capital. Real rates were very low. Arguably, for demographic reasons, that's starting to end. And we'll end up back in an era where actually the supply of capital with respect to the rate of return will be high again. Is that possible, unlikely, too far away to matter? First, one word one should, should never use in economics is never. And so <laughs> I, I don't want to preclude any possibility completely. Second, um, you, you uncharacteristically made an analytic conflation there. You conflated the idea that the, saving, that the savings rate would fall for a variety of reasons with the idea that the savings rate would become more elastic, which is a separate, which sure. is a separate issue. I don't see any reason to think the savings rate will become more elastic. And with respect to the savings rate falling, my reading of the evidence would be different. I think that the structural factors driving low interest rates, including longer life expectancy, which makes people save uh, more, increased insecurity, more inequality, are more likely to be semi-permanent than they are to prove transient. And I think a variety of the factors holding down investment, the demographic factor, the fact that you can buy an enormous amount of capital for a very low cost, think about my iPhone, um, all of that, I think, operates in the direction of uh, meaning uh, that we're likely to have this phenomenon of low real interest rates and secular stagnation for quite a long time to come. 